Welcome to the Mortgage Mum podcast with me, Sarah Tucker, founder of The Mortgage Mum, where we believe mortgages are about more than just money. Join us every week where we will share with you bite-sized tips, interviews with inspiring people inside and outside of our industry, and tools to help you achieve balance in every area of your life. a very warm welcome to today's episode of the Mortgage Mum podcast and today we are talking all about bridging finance. Now bridging finance has a bit of a bad reputation. People think it's really expensive, that you only use it for one thing, that it's all about speed and that it's an absolute last resort. So this episode is going to give you some real knowledge on bridging finance and help you understand exactly what it is, why you might need it and how it can be a fantastic solution as long as you're using it in the right way. As with anything, knowledge is power. And so I hope by listening to this episode that you're going to feel more equipped if a bridging loan is something that you're considering in the future, you're going to know if it's the right solution for you. As with anything, it's best to speak to an expert and we we work with some fantastic experts in the bridging finance area. It's a massive market. There are so many people out there doing it. So you need to make sure you've got somebody in the middle of it all that you know, like and trust um, because you need to make sure you're protecting yourself. So grab yourself a cuppa. I'm going to keep it short and sweet, just like Bridging Finance. (laughs) And I really hope you get something from this episode. Okay, so as we've talked about in the introduction, there are lots of people that have bad feelings when it comes to Bridging Finance. All you have to do is say the words and they're like, oh no, don't do that. Really expensive really, really expensive, really dangerous. And whilst that can be true, like anything, if you don't have the knowledge and you're not aware of why you're doing something and the dangers of it before you go into it, then of course it is a big investment and it is a big risk if you don't understand it. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the common reasons people use bridging finance, what it is and why you might want it. So first of all, what is bridging finance? Well, the word bridge is the key word here. It's um, it's when you need money for a short period of time. The bridging phrase comes from bridge the gap. So the idea of a bridging loan is to bridge the gap when it's needed. It's to give you access to a large amount of funds potentially for a short period of time. There's lots of different reasons why people use bridging loans or a bridge loan, it can be known, or bridging finance. Now, one of the main reasons is auctions. And the reason it's used for auctions is because if you buy a property at auction, there's a 28-day deadline for most properties. And that is virtually impossible for a mortgage lender to do, especially at the moment, because everything's taking twice as long as it used to because of COVID. So there's a big stigma around bridging finance at auctions that you can't actually buy property with bridging finance and that auction companies won't let you buy with bridging finance, but that's not true. So a bridge loan can be really, really useful if you need access to the money to buy a property at auction quickly so that you can meet the deadline, but you might not have sold your property yet, for example. So it's all about, with bridging finance, how you're going to repay it. It's all about what we call the exit. So with an auction property, for example, lots of people buy properties at auctions that are considered by mortgage lenders to be uninhabitable. If you haven't got a working bathroom or a working kitchen, lenders really are not too happy to lend a mortgage. It's considered unmortgageable. So a bridge in finance could help you purchase the property, first of all, within the deadline and allow you to get the work done on the property to make it habitable. And your exit in that scenario is going to be 
your mortgage. So once the property is mortgageable, it has a working kitchen and bathroom, you can get a normal mortgage on it and then you can pay the bridge off. And then it's really worked in your favour because without it, the answer is you would simply not have been able to buy the property. Some of the other reasons you might want to bridge is if you are a builder and you've got yourself some development finance and it's coming to the end of its term and the property's not finished yet or you've not sold the property yet, a bridge would help you while you're waiting to sell it. So you can pay back the development finance that's owed with a bridging loan on the basis that you'll try and sell the property. The other times a bridge is used is commercial to residential conversions. So there's lots of properties at the moment that are changing commercial properties into residential properties. And particularly at the moment, if a commercial property is empty for under for three months, you can, from August, turn them into a residential. Now, there's more information that's going to be released about this, but this is what we've been told. What with COVID, shutting down lots of offices, forcing people to work from home, there's lots of businesses that are reconsidering their commercial premises and thinking, well, actually, it works working from home, it's less of an overhead. There could be more and more properties like this. You're not going to be able to get a mortgage on those. And it's more efficient for you to get bridging finance, buy the commercial property and convert it into a residential potentially with the bridging money. And then once again, your exit will be that you can refinance it to a normal mortgage company at that point. Another reason you might want to get a bridge is if there's a unique opportunity and you need money quickly. So if you're buying a property below market value, for example, um, that could be a reason why you might need to look at a bridging loan. And in that scenario, they won't look at the purchase price. They'll look at the value of the property that you're securing it at. So if you have got a unique opportunity to buy a property below market value, that could be a really good solution. Another big reason, and has happened a lot recently, is chain collapses. It allows you to take back control. If your chain collapses and you can't get finance because you've lost your buyer, for example, you could potentially bridge that gap so that you don't lose the property that you've fallen in love with while you wait to sell it. Obviously, there are risks with this. And when you come to get the advice from a bridging finance specialist, those will be laid out for you. But these are just the typical scenarios that we see our clients get a bridging loan. The other ways you might use a bridge is when you're flipping properties. Lots of people do this because they don't want to tie themselves into a mortgage for a long period of time. So they will get a bridge in finance, they will renovate the property and they'll sell it. And they they only pay for the bridging loan rather than paying a big exit fee on a mortgage. Now, there are two types of bridging loan, closed and open. And with a closed bridging loan, there's a fixed repayment date. So you normally be given this if you've exchanged contracts, but you're waiting for your property sale to complete. So you know when you're going to be paying the bridge off. Most bridging loans that we deal with are open. And with an open loan, there's no fixed repayment date, but you would normally be expected to pay it off within a year. The lender will want to see evidence of how you're going to pay it off. That is what they're bothered about. They want to know what you're securing it against, how much equity is in that property and how you're going to pay it off. They often will want to see confirmation from a mortgage broker that you have got a mortgage that you can get at the end of this. They'll want to see evidence about the property you're purchasing and proof of what you're going to do to sell your current property if it's relevant. But you also do need to have a backup plan in place in case your repayment strategy fails. Now, the way you pay it can be different. So there's something called retained and service. If you do a retained option, there's no monthly payments And all the interest is added to the balance of the loan. So typically what you do is you pay 12 months worth of interest up front. 
And if you end up paying it off in six, then you'll get the difference back. But that's how they calculate it. Otherwise, the other way you do it is by service. And that's where you pay the interest monthly. And then you just pay the loan off at the end. Um, if you're doing retained, which is where there's no monthly payments and all the interest is added to the balance of the loan, there are lenders who we work with who don't care about your income at that point. If it's serviced, they generally will want to see three months bank statements and look at affordability. They'll be looking for regular direct debits and income and the surplus must cover the bridge cost. Some bridging companies do offer rolling interest as well. Um, but the key is in the exit. So typical ways people pay off a bridge in finance is by refinancing, as I said, with another mortgage, or they might sell the property, like they're flipping it, they might sell it, or they might have another property that they're going to sell and pay off the bridge with. So um, that is typically the main scenarios that you're going to pay a bridge off with. And as I say, they'll want to see some evidence of that. They'll definitely want to know and feel confident and comfortable that that's how you're going to do it and that it's completely feasible. In terms of fees, there's typically an arrangement fee going into the bridge. Some of them don't charge an exit fee often and don't have early repayment penalties, although every lender is different. Um, some will charge you an admin fee. Some will charge um, an exit fee. But there are lenders out there that won't charge either of those. And... So how a bridging loan works is when you take it out, a charge is placed on your property. And that is a legal agreement, which means that that lender will be repaid first if you fail to repay your loans. So if you still have a mortgage on your property, the bridging loan will have to sit behind it. So it will either be a first charge on your property or a second charge. If it's a second charge, it's going to sit behind your mortgage lender. Now, a lot of people say bridging loans are really expensive. Um, they are obviously more expensive than a mortgage. Um, fees are typically between half a percent and one and a half percent per month, but they're designed to be taken out for a short period of time. If you're comparing the price of a bridge to a normal mortgage, it is more expensive. The APR, for example, on a bridging loan is quoted as being 6.1% to 19.6%, which is far higher than any mortgage. But it's the fees, really. So typically, the arrangement fee is around 2% of the loan. And so it's only advisable that you take it out if you're only going to need it for a short period of time. So the fees are quite hefty going into it. You can add them to the loan potentially. Um, and the the exciting thing is with a bridge loan, the sky's the limit with how much lenders are prepared to borrow uh, to lend you. So it could be anything between 25 grand to 25 million. Um, the loan to value does make a difference. So how much deposit you have does make a difference. So to summarise, what is a bridging loan? It's a short term loan designed for property buyers and developers. Think of it as temporary short term mortgage. It can be used for so many reasons and it provides short-term finance until a per more permanent form of finance is arranged. It's bridge because you're bridging the gap. It's money that's going to get you from A to B. The money is typically provided very fast in comparison to mortgages. You can typically get the money within two to four weeks. So if you need money fast, this is the solution, especially if you're keeping it for a short period of time. It has high interest rates and fees for this reason, and they are generally used as a last resort. However, they can make complete sense when they're used correctly. They do share similarities with mortgages. Interest is paid on the term of the loan until the loan's repaid in full. There are more fees going into them and sometimes out of them. They are offered at variable and fixed rates, just like mortgages. And bridging finance is regulated by the FCA, but there are some that are unregulated. Typically, the 12-month terms are regulated by the FCA and 18-month terms are typically non-regulated. It takes less time to get them. It's less of an intricate process. It's all about the exit. It's less about the income. 
it's more about how you're going to pay it off. However, in order to pay it off, you're typically going to need to get a mortgage. And that's where we come in. And really, that's where affordability comes back in. As we said earlier in the episode, it can be packaged as a first charge or a second charge loan. And there's open or closed bridging loans. There's lots of scenarios when you can use bridging, moving house, investing in property, developing property. And it's largely assessed on the value of the property. Mortgage lenders do want to know about your income, as I say. Bridging loan, not so much. You will need a survey, as with any mortgage. The bridging lender will carry out a survey to make sure that the loan's safe and that it's not too high risk, and that will be done by a qualified surveyor. If they don't think it's worth what you've said that you think it's worth, they will tell you. Um, They need to look at worst case scenario for the lender. So you can appeal evaluation if that happens. And I've got a whole episode on what you do if you do get a down valuation earlier in the series. Loan to value is important and every lender lends a different amount. So you need to speak to a broker to find out what that is. But it can be 80%, 75%. And we have even been told that some go to 90%. And gross development value is something that I haven't mentioned yet, but they can offer loans based on the gross development value of your project. The gross development value is basically calculated on what the property will be worth once work's completed. So if you're doing it for development, this can be how they work it out. So if you're buying a property below market value and then you're doing work to it, then the lender, the bridging lender will consider what it's going to be worth once you've developed and renovated it. And they'll generally lend you the money in stages. Um, The difference between what a bridging loan and a mortgage lender would lend you in that scenario is massive. So you definitely need to be speaking about that if you are thinking of doing a development project. There's a whole episode we could do on development finance alone, but it's very, very personal and specific to you. It's all about the exit strategy. And in order to get a bridging loan, you basically need to speak to a broker that works with bridging lenders and is experienced in dealing with them because it is quite different to a mortgage. There is a high risk with bridging and the risk is that if you don't pay it off when you think you will, you're going to be paying high interest rates and you're going to get stuck with it. You need to make sure that exit strategy has a backup plan and that you feel comfortable and confident with it because the risk is if you can't pay the bridge off, that's the biggest risk. For us and for the specialist providers that we work with, we would ensure that doesn't happen. So we look at your exit strategy and we make sure it's watertight. But obviously we rely on you to keep your situation the same so that you are still um, going to be able to get the mortgage that, that you've looked into beforehand. I hope that's given you a bit of a short, sweet overview. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions around this. Just get in touch with us and... Um, yeah, maybe bridging finance will be for you. Maybe one day you will be glad that you listened to this. Um, It's a massive market. There are 166 bridging lenders out there at the moment. So lots of people are doing these loans and it's just a case of making sure it's the right fit for you and that you're getting all the right advice around it and that you're aware of the implications. So I hope this helps and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Mortgage Mum podcast and I hope you learned something new today and felt inspired in some way. Here at the Mortgage Mum we really believe in people supporting people so if you've enjoyed this episode of the Mortgage Mum podcast please share and subscribe and rate and review this podcast and let's keep supporting each other. And of course if you would like help with your mortgage or your insurance, head over to www.themortgagemum.co.uk or contact any one of the team on social media. We would love to help you. Thank you for listening.